Beginning with verse number 1, follow along with me, please. We're going to read down through the first six verses of Psalms 85. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast thought, brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Now look with me, if you will, please, back to the 78th Psalm. Look at Psalm 78. Here he writes a history concerning the children of Israel and how that God brought them through a strange land and gave them all that they needed to get them through the land. And I've always determined, and at least in my heart, that I know that God can bring us, amen, can bring us from captivity and give us freedom and glorious liberty. And of course, we know that that's been purchased for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in verses 18 and 19, the Bible says concerning the people of God, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God and said, and here's a question today, I think that every Christian has, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The psalmist asked a question, two important questions in this portion of Scripture. In Psalms chapter 79 here, the question was asked of God's people, or of the people of Israel, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I believe the great comfort, comforting psalm, and the reason why it's been used so many times at funerals in Psalms 23, is because it provides such great comfort and peace to a believer. Where the psalmist took great assurance in the fact, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then he said, He furnishes for me a table in the wilderness. Amen? And he supplies it greatly. Now the psalmist asks the second question in Psalms 85. He says of God, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may what? Rejoice in thee. There's one thing that's seriously lacking in many of the New Testament churches today. It's this fact. There's no rejoicing in the things of God. That's why I like some of those songs that we sing here. It is well with my soul. It's an opportunity to rejoice in your heart for what God has done for you. There's a world that's troubled today. A world that will not, it seems, be brought to her knees. They have decided already that they want nothing to do with God. They care nothing for the Son of God. And there's a world that's miserable of people that are not satisfied by social gifts. And the government today just keeps giving and giving and giving, but it will not satisfy man. The more that he gets physically, the more that he'll want. And the more that he'll think that he needs. And the greatest satisfaction for the heart of man is not what he needs in this life physically, but what he needs spiritually. Amen. For it isn't this life that's ultimately important. This is just a stopping off place to get ready for somewhere else. And I'm glad of that. I'm glad I'm not going to have to permanently live here. And the cry ought to be from gospel-preaching churches across America today for a real revival where the saints of God again could rejoice in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to label you. You can look for some labels if you start rejoicing in the Lord. You can look for some folks who belong to dry-eyed churches, formal churches, where if they don't sing the doxology, they don't think they've been there. You can look for those folks to give some criticism against churches where they have an old-fashioned tent meeting. You can get look for some criticism to come for churches where people believe that they can rejoice and say amen and shout hallelujah and have a good time in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can expect some criticism. Now, let's say this. If the criticism is based upon the Bible, then they're right and we're wrong. But my Bible teaches me that as a child of God, I have something to be happy about. My Bible teaches me that I can live the revival experience all the time. I don't have to wait until a special week of meetings where a man comes in and gives us a revival. I can believe that God can give us a revival every Sunday. I can believe that God can give us a revival every Wednesday. I can believe that God can give us a revival in our homes, in our private devotional times when we worship God in spirit and in truth, there in front of the couch or there in the bedroom or washing dishes or on the assembly line, pumping gas, getting groceries, wherever we're at. I believe that God can give and wants to give today and will give genuine revival without any special time necessarily having to be set aside. 
And I believe that this week of of revival for the Christian ought to be a time when we are especially encouraged, when we are especially edified, and when the saints of God can refresh themselves, renew themselves again at the fountain of living waters in such a way that they might progress and go forward and do something more for God. I believe that if a revival ought to do anything, and I'm talking about the setting aside of a week of meetings, I believe that if it ought to do anything, it ought to refresh the people of God. It ought to get them to see the same thing that the psalmist saw here in Psalms 85 when he talks about forgiving the iniquity of thy people. But look down in verse 4 of Psalms 85. He says, Turn us, O God of our salvation. There's one thing that the psalmist seemed to be praying for here was that God might grant repentance to the people of God that they might be refreshed in the things of God. And in this day of spiritual drought when we're so dry... And so inhibited spiritually, and we can't let the Bible be the open book that it needs to be anymore. We need to be turned again to God. And we need to pray the same prayer concerning, as the psalmist prayed when he said, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. Now, I'm convinced that in the wilderness of the world, and I'm convinced that in a day when it is spiritually dry in most places, that God can furnish a table in the wilderness. I believe that He can give us those things spiritually that we need to have and those things that spiritually we need to be partaking of. The psalmist constantly reminded us that we should take of the Lord Jesus, that we should receive of Him. He said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And he constantly referred to the fact that we need to get to the rock. We need to get to the place where we can get from God that refreshment that we need. There was that rock and horror that followed the children of Israel, that gave them just exactly what they needed in the wilderness. When there was no water, God gave them water through the instrument of the man of faith, Moses. And as a result of it, the children of Israel experienced many times great blessings from the Lord. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians that that rock that followed them in the wilderness was not just an ordinary rock. That rock was Christ. And as he followed the children of Israel through the wilderness and guarded them and guided them and took them on their journey and gave them experiences in a great land that flowed with milk and honey, so that same God today can still furnish a table in the wilderness. And I believe after having been to that land and saw that rock wherein they believed that Moses gave the water or got the water from God out of that rock, I believe in seeing that land that is destitute of anything green, Nothing, it seems, but old scrubby thistles and bushes of no repute growing down there. I've I've never seen such a devastating land, it appears, in all of my life than that land where that water comes out of that rock. And uh, I'll tell you, in that place, it's no wonder that the children of Israel got thirsty. And it's no wonder that there might have been some questions. I'm sure that if we would have been there, there would have been some questions from us, too. What did you bring us out here in the wilderness for? There's no water out here. There's nothing for our cattle. You've brought us out here just to die. That's the only reason why we're here. But God in that wilderness furnished them with a rock that from out of that flint came water. And when that water came, I'll guarantee you one thing. It was probably the most refreshing water of all. It was that water that God promised and that water that God gave and that water that God gives yet today that's the greatest of all. Amen. And He gives it and furnishes it in a wilderness, a world where there seems to be no hope and where everybody seems to be excluded from any hope or from any promise or from any comfort or from any peace. God sends great refreshing. I'm believing that this ought to be our question today. We ought to ask it of God. We ought to say, God, can't there be a revival in this day? I know that it's popular among fundamentalists today to believe that there's not going to be any last day revival. Well, that may be true on a national scale, but I still believe that God can give revival in local churches. I still believe that God can give refreshment and give revival and give a reinstituting of the thoughts of God and a reevaluating and an infilling of the Holy Spirit in our churches today to the likes of which we've never seen it before. I don't know whether you do any dreaming when you think about the property. I dream almost all the time. I laid in bed last night. It was 2 o'clock this morning. I had my elbow on the bed and I had my head up. And my wife said, why don't you relax and go to sleep? And I had my head up like this. 2 o'clock in the morning. And she's laying down in bed and I'm just laying there. I'm laying in bed, but I got my elbow down on my pillow. And I got my hand on my elbow. She said, what are you thinking about? I said, well, 
I'm thinking about the camp now. I'm thinking about the tent meeting. thinking about the church. thinking about what God's getting ready to do. And I get to thinking about it sometimes, and I get so excited, I can't keep my mind on what I'm supposed to be doing. I really do. I was picking up the glass and, and just sort of a general cleanup of this property the other day with our new little toy that we got, the tractor. And I was over here cleaning things up, kind of looking at things, and I got thinking. I looked over at this property that way, and I looked at it that way, and I said, Just think, Lord, we're not going to be here in about two years. I mean, we're going to be gone, and we're going to be out there on that property, and we're going to be picking up stuff off of that, and we're going to be cleaning that up. We're going to have somebody out of the road directing people to come in with a trailer, pulling them in, parking them on the places where they need to get them. Amen? People are going to be registering at the office, and they're going to be getting ready to stay in dormitories. We're going to have folks coming in for a whole week. People who are in this area that don't attend this church but are hungry for something like this are already saying, and the stories came to me yesterday from the Penningtons and folks they talked to us that we can't wait till the camp gets out there because we're going to come out there and stay all week long when you have the camp meeting. It's going to be a time that I believe God is getting ready to send revival to this area. I don't know that it's going to catch off on a national scale, but I'm convinced that God wants to do something. And He wants to get people to the place where they can again rejoice in the things of God. Now, what kind of a revival do we need? And very simply today, I'm just going to give you a little message on about four W's that we need in revival today. And the psalmist asked the question, Will thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. And he said, they asked the question, the people said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And I believe he can, and I believe here's the answer to the wilderness that surrounds us today. What do we need? We need a revival, amen? Every time you get ready to preach on revival, everybody opens their Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14, which is probably one of the best verses, if not the best verse in the Bible. But I told Ronnie Richardson last night, I said, how are yesterday? I said, ha, ha, I'm not going to preach on Second Chronicles seven fourteen. He said, you're going to... And now says you're going to preach on revival, and everybody's going to open their Bible. Second Chronicles 7.14, that's where they're going to stay. But I believe there's more places in the Bible that speaks about revival than just Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. Every, every worldly experience that the children of Israel went through, wherein they were delivered and brought to a place to where they again recognized the God of their salvation, was to them a revival. And every time we get a little bit cold and get a little bit different to the things of God, and we need a real revival, and God sends us a man who refreshes us and restores us again and gives us the right fellowship and the right outlook on the work of God, that's a revival. And God can do it time and time and time again. And I'm intrigued by past revivals in the history books of America and in historical reviews around the world. They were not started by 10,000 people getting together in the cow palace in San Francisco, California, and saying, hey, we're going to have revival because we got a crowd. They were started from some little lonely mother who lived out on the back roads behind the bush somewhere, who got up early in the morning and petitioned God behind an old stump and said, God, give me my boys for you. God, give me my daughters for you. God, give me my neighborhood for you. And somebody heard that she was out there praying, and they came one morning and said, Can I pray with you? Sure. They both got together and said, God, give us our children. God, give us our neighborhood. God, give us our church. Sooner or later, some other folks began to hear about it, and they said, can we join you in prayer? The next thing you know, you had a group of people who were meeting in a prayer cell, and they began to pray and petition God. From that, the pastor would get excited. He would join in on the prayer cell. The next thing you knew, you had a great revival fire burning from church to church and neighborhood to neighborhood and city to city. But it all started with the excitement and with the endurance of one person who said, God, I want something special from you. God, I want to see something done. God, I'm sick of all the deadness, and I'm sick of all the coldness. I'm sick of all the backsliding. I'm sick of all the criticism. and I'm sick of all that's taking place in our nation, in our neighborhood, in our schools, and in our churches. And God, I want to see something done. And upon the appropriation of those particular spiritual duties in the lives of perhaps one person, God began to move in a mighty way, and revival fires would sweep. That's the way they got started in Wales. That's the way they got started in Scotland. That's the days of great revival of Charles Finney and of Dwight L. Moody. As you read about them, as they wrote concerning what happened in the days when they experienced revival. And I'm convinced that it will take just perhaps that one, or it will take just perhaps that group, that church, those people who want to see the job done to get the revival back where it ought to be again today. And I'm, I'm believing, God, that we can see it. I'm believing God that we can see it this week. I'd like to believe God that we might have to leave this tent up for two weeks. Amen? Well, Roger may have to come on Saturday and Sunday and preach all next week. 
God's life will get in this thing and I'll say, you say, preacher, would you leave it tonight? I'll leave it up till October. Amen. I felt God was in it and we were seeing revival and we were experiencing what God would have us to have. We're not in any big hurry. When it got too cold to meet out here, we'd go on with it in there. I'd like to see it. Amen? And I'll tell you something else about real revival. The world will not understand for at first what's going on. But sooner or later, their curiosity gets the best of them till they can stay away from it no longer. They'll wonder why the lights are burning up at Faith Baptist Church every night till midnight. Said my land first, it was a tent, now it's in the church. Everywhere you go, that church has experienced something. Something's going on up there. And you can't keep quiet about something like that. The next thing you know, God's people will be talking about it. Everywhere you go, buzz here, buzz there, buzz here, buzz there. The witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that we could see great things happening. I'd like to see the barns closed in some of this area. I'd like to see the pornographic bookstore. I'd like to see the adult theater closed up. I'd like to see those places that are ruining our young people and ruining our homes and causing confusion in our land. I'd like to see those places run out of business. Amen. I'd like to see men who ought to be good fathers and would make good fathers get on the water wagon, leave the booze alone. Amen. I'd like to see the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company practically go out of business. Amen. I'd like to see Christians get their hearts right and begin to serve again. All right. You say, preacher, are you going to preach? I've already done some of it, but let's look, please, if you will. What kind of a revival do we need today? First of all, I believe we need a revival of words. You say, preacher, what do you mean by we need a revival of words? Well, I'm not just talking about a separated communication, though we do need that, and we'll deal with that a little bit later when we get into another W. But we need a revival of some good old-fashioned fundamental words that are in the Bible. Brother, we've, we've sanitized everything. We've snowballed them, you know. We've cleaned everything all up with something artificial and something put on. And we've forgotten good old-fashioned words. Somebody's trumping himself up and down the country today saying, uh, what we need is for people to walk forward and commit their lives to Christ. And I say that that's a wrong word to use for unsaved people. Because unsaved people have nothing to commit to Christ. Why in the world can't we get back to the good old-fashioned words that Jesus used when he spoke to Nicodemus and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be what? Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And I think the word decision may be a good word, but we've overworked the word. We've overused the word. And we're not sensitive to the word decision anymore. How about when we use what Jesus said to Peter, when thou art converted? How about let's talk about a change in somebody's life? How about let's use words of the Bible? Now, Peter didn't see anything wrong with the word born again. When you get to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse number 23, he said, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. We've gotten to the place to where our words don't add up many times with what the Bible teaches. And it's become so easy. And there's nothing to it. Shake my hand. I bow my head and pray. You repeat after me. Well, you can repeat all you want to repeat. But if God's words are not in it, it'll not work. And I like those old-fashioned words. The world doesn't understand what you mean when you say, I'm saved. But it's a Bible word. Peter said in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none of the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's a good word. It's a good word. I would to God we could get back to where we could have a revival of some Bible words. Some words that would strengthen the people of God. Some words that would reach out in the community and win lost men and women, boys and girls, to the Lord Jesus Christ that they talk about on the assembly line. That they talk about in the grocery store. Amen? We could get our radio stations back again to putting into our homes some good substantial gospel music without having to listen to all the junk we're having to listen to on so-called gospel radio stations today. I get so sick and tired, we got out of the softball league. And the main reason why we got out of the softball league is a couple of reasons. One of the men on one of the teams from one of the other churches last week went to the bathroom out on the, on the softball field. I'll guarantee you one thing, God's not favor that kind of junk. And our men had enough guts to say, we're not going to play no more. So, well, we apologize. They all not let that kind of junk play on their teams in the first place. They take a separated stand in the churches. They wouldn't have that kind of thing. They let them play ball just because they want to get them into church for a Sunday or two. Bless God, we need to have men on the ball field. They're separated for the glory of God also. But there's another reason why we got out. We found out that every time the scores were uh, planted after the team, after the, after the game was over, that they announced them on WYFC. And we do not support WYFC. Now, that may not set too good with some of you. 
Some of you here for the first time today, you say, I came here, I didn't want to hear that. Well, you're going to hear it anyhow. Sit around for a little while, listen to what else we got to say. Maybe some of it will sink in somewhere. I'm not going to listen to that station with all their junk that goes on up there. They don't care for the things of God. they got programs called Following Jesus, and they don't know nothing about it. They cooperate with every hoodwink that comes along. It doesn't matter just so long as it's religious. They'll support it. Well, bless God, we need some good old-fashioned music today to seek to glorify and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll put something into you. Say, preacher, don't you like music and pat your foot too? You know better than that. I like to clap my hands, pat my foot, and shout amen, glory to God, run the aisle if I feel the Holy Spirit of God's in it. But I don't have to have 30-second beat music in order to enjoy myself. I don't have to have it all that double and quadruple and, and all the sextet beats. I don't have to have all that business. I'm going to tell you something. We're creating a sexual atmosphere in our churches with that kind of music that we're soon not going to be able to overcome. Because that kind of music is a music of the mind. And music, worldwide, is the greatest means of communication that mankind has one with another. I'll have to admit that. You have to admit it. I don't understand Pollocks, but I like their polkas. And their music communicates and talks to me. And I'm not a... You know, I never cared too much for the Führer. But I like the German marches. And I like to hear them old bands. You know what? I, every time I play that band, I got band music on my stereo in my car, and I push that eight-track band music in, and every time I'm going down the road, I want to stop the car and get out and march. It puts Warren boots on me. I like that music. It moves me, and I, I, it moves me for the right thing. It moves me to be a na- of a nationalistic spirit, and that's another thing. I love America. I think she's still the best nation on the top side of God's dirt. I've been other places, and I'd rather live here than anywhere else. Amen. I've had to put up. You can't even drink the water over in most of the places where you go. You better be glad you're in America where you can eat the food and drink the water and know that you're going to be at least decently healthy. Bless God, we need to get our places back and our churches back to where we can communicate with the things of God. And Bible language ought to be a great part of our lives. Read your Bible, study the book, and get familiar with with the terms that God uses concerning His work. We need a revival of good old-fashioned Bible words again. We need to talk about being saved. We need a revival of the word holiness. That's so much forgotten about today. We're afraid somebody's going to call us, you know, one of the others. If we use the term holiness. Oh, no. I don't want to use that preacher. I'm afraid of it. Somebody's going to label me wrong. Well, they label you wrong if you use Bible words anyhow. And there isn't anything wrong with being holy. There isn't anything wrong with being separated. There isn't anything wrong with being right with God. There isn't anything wrong with being in fellowship with Him. There isn't anything wrong in being in tune with the Word of God and doing what God would have you to do. But God, we need a revival of good old-fashioned Bible words today that will strengthen the people of God. Second of all, you knew I was going to get to this one sooner or later. I've already hit it. We'll just hit it another lick or two. We need a revival of works. Christians getting busy and doing something. Now, let me say this, and I know we didn't need every hand in the whole church up here yesterday, but we practically did have. But we could have found something for you to do if you had been here. If you could have been here and weren't. Now, if you couldn't have been here, and you had no way in the world you could have been here, and you had something that kept you from coming, that's a horse of another color. But if you could have been here yesterday, like Billy Dorsey said, and I want to tell you something about Billy. Billy's going to Baptist Bible College. He's giving his heart and life and soul up to the things of God. And we need to pray for him. Guy's haircut. I still think a man ought to look like a man. I really do. Excuse me. No, don't excuse me either. Say, well, I don't like that. Well, you didn't agree with it. That's okay. We don't care. But uh, Billy's going to school. And Billy said this morning he came here and he was already sitting here when I got here 20 minutes after 9. He was sitting here. I think he had come and let Ronnie go home so Ronnie could get ready because I forgot about Ronnie this morning. Left him all up here, and I was supposed to have been here at 8.30 to see to it. He went home, and I forgot all about it. Didn't get here about 20 after 9. But Bill Dorsey came, and Ronnie went home, got his clothes changed. We'd come back for church. When I came in, I said, boy, these seats are kind of dusty. going to have to be dusted. He said, you got a rag? And I said, well, I think I got one or two in the trunk of the car. He said, get them for me. So I did, and he was dusting the chairs. And I came back in. You know what he said to me? And I think it was great spiritual insight that he said it. He said, I ought to pray over in one of these seats that I wipe off. I said, buddy, that's a good idea. That's what they do at Myrtle. Every bed they make. Every dish they wash, every pillowcase they put on the pillows at Myrtle, Mississippi, that Bible conference camp, 
when those women are making those beds, all the while they're stretching the sheets, all the while they're patting the pillows, all the while they're putting the blanket on the bed, all the while they're putting the towels at the head of the bed for people to use. They say, oh God, whoever sleeps in this bed, Percy Ray instructs his people to kneel down beside of every bed when they get it made. They put their hands on the bed. It's just a means of showing God your support of his work. And they put their hands up there and they lay out over the top of that bed and say, oh God, the person who sleeps in this bed, give them a special blessing. If there's somebody, Lord, sleeps in this bed that's unsaved, save them. Oh God, send a special blessing to the person who comes in and walks on this sidewalk. Bless the person who sits in this pew in the tabernacle. They go through the whole camp. Every time they get ready to have a camp meeting, they go through the whole camp and they pray over everything, over every bit of food that comes in there. They pray and say, God grant a blessing to the person who eats a forkful of these beans. It's hard for me to see the blessing in eating that cornbread, but I guess there's one there. Bless God, we need to get back to the place today where you don't have to pump Christians every time and prime them and put new letters in them every week to get them to get busy for God. Amen. A revival of works is what we need. People getting involved in the work of God so they can't spend too much time at the church. Now, I've been there too much, preacher. I can't come every night to the revival meeting. You realize I have to get up early in the morning and I can't stand to be there till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and get up in the morning. You haven't learned how to pray yet. You can go home 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and pray for God to give you eight hours sleep and the amount of time you're going to get to bed. You say, well, it won't work. It will if you believe God for it. He'll get you up every day and keep you excited. Amen? I know by the end of the week you're going to get mighty tired and you're going to say, whew, it's sure been a rough week. But I'll guarantee you one thing. After you get a little extra rest the following week and you get caught up again, you're going to say to yourself, boy, I'll tell you one thing. I really enjoy being at that tent meeting every week. I'm glad I was there. Amen. God give us a revival of works where the people of God will enjoy the service of the Lord. Oh, Lord, wilt thou not revive this people again that they may rejoice in thee? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Amen. Can he give us a place where we can see the work of God to be done? Amen. He sure can. Thirdly, we need a revival of will. I mean surrendered will. Submissive to the things of God. We need a revival of Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20, where Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We need a revival of will. We need a revival where people would care about being shipwrecked. We need a revival where people wouldn't care about having the best of everything on the back. We need a revival where people don't care about having the best of everything on the table. And I believe God wants His saints to have the best. But we've got to get to the place to where we don't care about the best before God can give us the best. You've heard the story, but I'm going to tell it one more time. About the old Negro slave that was so happy and always sang. Sang all the time. And his master came to him and said, Oh, Joe, he said, I don't know how you can be so happy all the time. He said, Look at you, you're broke. You don't have a penny, and yet, while you're harvesting the cotton in the fields and dragging that old long cotton sack behind you, you're always singing about the Lord. And you're always talking about how happy you are in the Lord. You're always talking about how much you got in Jesus. And he said, you don't have anything down here. How in the world can you be happy? He said, Master, you don't understand. I serve the greatest of all. And one day, the Master got to wondering about old Joe. And he said, old, old Joe, he said, old Joe, he said, I've got all the money. And I've got the master house, and this is my plantation, been belonging to my family for a long time. And you're one of my slaves. But he said, Oh, Joe, you've got the happiness, and I don't have it. I'm like, No, how do I get the kind of happiness and joy that you got? And old Joe said, I'll tell you what you got to do, master. He said, You got to go out to that old pig pen. Kneel down in that old pig pen, and all the muck and the mire and the swill hole of where the old pigs have found. And you got to get out there and meet with God. And the master said, I'm not going to do it. Not me, the richest man in all of this territory. No, the one who owns the big plantation. I'm not going to do it. I simply won't do it. But it continued and continued, and the Spirit of God continued to work in the Master's heart, and old Joe's happiness just got more and more and more all the time. So finally went to him one day, and he said, Joe, he said, I, with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, I can't stand it any longer. I'm so under conviction. He said, I'm ready to go to the hog pen. All you got to do is lead me the way. And old Joe said, no, 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 Master, you don't have to go. You just have to be willing, that's all. Amen. Amen. You've got to be willing. You've got to submit yourself under the will of God. And let God take care of everything. 
I'll tell you, if it meant living in a hog pen, you've got to be willing to live there. Amen? Now, you don't have to live there, but you've got to be willing to. It means just submitting yourself sold out to the things of God, lock, stock, and barrel, and entitling yourself as the Apostle Paul titled himself in the book of Romans and in other places. He said, Paul, servant of God. Bless God, we need to submit ourselves to the will of God and be servants of God for His honor and His glory. Then the last point I want to deal with is we need a revival of winning. Bless God, Christians have been on the bottom side of things too long. We've accepted backseat philosophy from people. They've called us ignorant because we believe the Bible. They said we're simple and plain because we've understood that when God said something in His Word, He meant just what He said. They said, you, you, you Christians, you're going to lose. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm on the winning side, and we need to get back that philosophy in our Christian lives again that we're winning. They're the ones who are losing. They're losing now, and they're losing out in eternity. They're missing out on what they do not understand. That is the best. Amen. The best that they can have. We need a revival where Christians come back to be a number one again, and don't you dare take a back seat for anybody because of what you believe. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about this dear and blessed old book. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about the deity of Christ. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about His second coming. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about hell. Don't you be ashamed of what you believe about heaven. Don't you be ashamed of what the Bible teaches about the church and the church that you belong to. You're winning. Amen? Not only do we need to get on the top side of winning in that area, but we need to get again on the top side of winning souls for the glory of God by a good old-fashioned work of repentance in the hearts and lives of people. Don't worry. The devil just trying to kill us. We need to get on the winning side. Somebody turn these light bulbs out before they burn the tent down. Amen! We need to get on the winning side again. I'd like to see us get back to where we preach Proverbs 11:30 and mean it. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, but he that wins souls is wise. Amen. Amen. I mean, so winning with a repentance emphasis. So winning to where we can see a change in the heart of man when he's been saved. We don't have to harp at him all the time, do this and do that. Martha came to me this morning with a book that was borrowed from me by one of the ladies who had been attending our church for quite a while. And and I don't know, I guess there's always been some confusion, and I never could get through the confusion that seemed to be there. But she brought the book back to me this morning and said, Put you. So the lady brought this book to me and said, Give it to you. She was leaving, and she was going to Jesus' only church where she could talk in tongues. Which I'm glad she left, because she did find out one thing while she was here. She couldn't do it here. She knew she had to get out here and get somewhere else. Because we're not going to put up with that sort of thing. So, preacher, doesn't that make you feel bad? It makes me feel good. Not that she left, but it makes me feel good to know that we had a standard enough so she knew that we were not going to be hoodwinked into believing that sort of thing. Bless God. I tell you, I want to see people saved, and I want to see people one to the Lord, but I don't want to see them with just one, two, three, four, quick as a wink, lucky, lucky me sort of thing. I want to see them to where their old-fashioned repentance is again preached, and they're told that when you're saved, you've got to turn from your sin because God directs you to do so. You need to live different for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the week that God has given us that we can joy, enjoy the blessings of God and we can win. And we can be on the winning side. We need to see a revival of good old-fashioned winning again. Good old-fashioned days when Christians get the victory by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And bless God, Christians don't have to lose. And Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Amen. We can be happy in glory and tribulation also, because our Savior has overcome the greatest tribulation and the trial of all. And He has captured death, and He holds it captive, and we're victors today because of Him. Get on the winning side. Get on the winning side. We need a revival of winning. Oh, God, wilt thou revive thy work and this people? that they, thy people, may rejoice in thee. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Let me ask you something. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah said, I can't have a baby. For crying out loud, I'm 90 years old. I don't know whether she said for crying out loud or not. But she said, I'm 90 years old and Abraham's 100. And that's unheard of. That doesn't happen. 
And she kind of snickered about it. And God, the Lord, who was there, said, You will have a baby. And you laughed. And she said, No, 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 I didn't laugh. He said, Yes, you did, but you're still going to have the baby. And she did. And I'm going to guarantee you one thing. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And that was the question that was asked of Sarah and Abraham. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? It was asked again in the book of Jeremiah concerning the people of Israel who were so backslidden, so far away from God, that Jeremiah looked out over the people with his ocean of tears that fell from his eyes and seemed to say, it's impossible for this people to be turned back to God. But God said to Jeremiah, as he set him down for just a minute, made him consider, he said, Jeremiah, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is, is there, are there any hopeless cases that you know of of people who can't be saved? I knew of a hopeless case who just absolutely, according to all the records of people who lived in his neighborhood, said he never will be any good. He never will be saved. He is a bum. He doesn't do nothing but lay out drunk all the time. He's gone from his family five, six, seven days at a time. And he's wrecked two automobiles. He's been in jail. He's lost his driver's license. He's a stinking bum. He never will be worth nothing. He is no good. That's me. People said... Dwayne Rutherford never be worth a plug nickel. He ain't nothing but a bum. Even my wife said that. She had every right in the world to say it. She said he ain't no good. Every time she used to hear a siren in the night when I'd been gone three, four days and hadn't been home, she used to say, I hope it's my husband. I hope he's dead. When she heard about the automobile accident with the car and saw the blood inside the automobile, she said her heart leaped within her because she thought I was dead. Would have made her happy if I'd have died. I can't blame her. I never came home. I never paid any attention to the kids. Never paid any attention to her. Never cared for the right kind of things. I don't blame her a bit. But oh, one day on August the 10th, 1960, something got a hold of me. Moved me from near the back row of an old-fashioned meeting, revival meeting where I was attending, brought me up to an old-fashioned altar prayer and saved my never-dying soul and gave me a hope and a peace and took the whiskey bottle out of my hand and gave me a book in place of it. Amen! Saved my soul, gave me eternal life, and I'll never be the same again. I got saved so good I hadn't got over it yet. Huh. Amen! That's the kind of salvation that the Lord can give. May I advertise to you today that that kind of salvation that delivers an old drunkard from hell, delivers him out of the orange lantern and puts him at Faith Baptist Church, that which did it for me can do it for you. We need that kind of a revival today to where we can believe that a drunkard can quit drinking. Amen? That an alcoholic hasn't got to take a course at the double A to get it. All he's got to take is this book. He doesn't have to have the company and companionship of a lot of other folks who quit. He doesn't have to call somebody in the middle of the night and say, i got a problem, and I need to talk to you. If I don't talk to you, I'm going to go out and get drunk. What he needs to do is get up in the middle of the night, roll over, and get down on the bed and say, The Lord, i got a problem. And i got to talk to you or I'm going to go and get drunk. And the Lord will say, all right, I'll take the time. If you got the time, i got the time. We'll just discuss it together. And I guarantee you that's the way you get over it. I laid in bed after I got saved, and the wall wouldn't even stay still. The bed seemed to tip right over in the place where I was. The cold sweat would break out on me, and I'd lay in bed and shake until I'd sweat the bed so bad my wife would say, I'm going to have to get up and change the sheets. And I'd see snakes crawling out of the wall. I even tried to kill them with pots and pans from out of the cupboard one night. DTs, delirium tremens, until I couldn't see straight, couldn't act right. Didn't know who I was. But bless God, cold turkey, six weeks, I got over it. God delivered me, and I didn't have to go to the AA to do it either. No siree. I just kept my mind on the things of God and kept my thoughts collected upon Him. The men that I worked with in the shop, they came by and said, Hey, you hear about old Rutherford over there? He got religion. They was lying. They didn't know what they was talking about. Dwayne Rutherford didn't get any religion. He just got saved. That's all. Amen. I didn't have to have religion. I had salvation. Salvation is so much greater than religion. If you ever get salvation, you'll get rid of your religion. Right. Amen. The salvation will make the difference. Glory to God. He'll do it. What do we need? We need a revival. What kind of a revival? We need a table in the wilderness. And we need a place where God's people can rejoice. 
We need to get back to where our will is submitted to Him. We need to get back to where we have a revival of good old-fashioned words that will get the job done for God. We need to get back to where we have a revival where Christians don't always have to be pumped where they're willing to do the work of God. We need to get back to where we have a revival where Christians get on the winning side again. Where we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We need to get back to the place to where we believe that when we're on the winning side, everybody can be on that side and we can win them if we would just go get them. And I'm convinced today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, young man, young lady, dad or mom, little boy, little girl, whoever you are, if you're not saved, I'm convinced I know a Savior who can save you. I'm convinced I know of a blood that can cleanse you from your sin and can give you new life. I know how you can get on the winning side. You've been losing. You had not had enough money to go around. Kids have been sick all the time. Can't get them well. Can't have anything go right. Amen. Marriage is about ready to fall apart. And everything seems to be going wrong. I know the answer. And it isn't Clyde Naramore, nor it isn't any other psychologist, nor any psychiatrist. It isn't spending $50 an hour to get counsel from some worldly man who doesn't know what the Bible said. The answer to getting your marriage back to where it ought to be. The answer to getting your home back to where it ought to be. The answer to getting the money back in your pocket where it ought to be is get saved. And give up to God. That's the answer. If you're discouraged and defeated and you're depressed and your life's not been what it ought to be and you know that you've got to get that thing straight as a Christian today, that may be the case. Then here's an altar to set yourself free today. If you're under bondage because you're lost and you're a slave to sin, you're a slave to bottle, you're a slave to cigarette, you're a slave to something in your life that's adverse to God and you're just a slave and you can't get rid of it, come to Jesus Christ. He'll help you to get rid of it today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, God, give us a revival in our heart. God, let it spread. Let it start here. Let it start, first of all, in my heart today. And God, let it spread to the hearts and lives of believers that are here. Revival. Oh, God, give us, as we look forward to it this week, genuine revival. Let's win again. Oh, God, help us to win. Help us to realize that we're not defeated. We don't have to be ashamed when somebody criticizes us because of what we believe. God, you've given us the victory. We don't have to be ashamed. We hold our head up high and say we're on the right side. And God, I know that fishing on the right side is where all the fish are. So help us to get on the side you direct us to. And God, where we can get the job done, where we can win, where we can work, where our will be submitted to God, where our words are such that they'll administer truth to those who would hear. And then, Lord, there may be someone here today that's unsaved, doesn't know what it means to have eternal life. I've looked out across this audience today. I've seen some who from the beginning of this service to right now have not been the least bit involved. They're so spiritually cold. They're so dead and they're so dry. They claim to be saved. And, Father, it makes us as humans wonder about them. They can't sing when the songs of Zion are being sung. They don't even open the hymn book. They're so dead and so dry and so backslid. They've forgotten all about the things of God. And I pray, God, today either break their heart or break their life up some way. And, Lord, there are those who have been critical of our work here at Faith Baptist Church who, who have left us and who need to have their heart broke. I pray you might do it. Oh, God, we want those here that are supposed to be here that the glory of God might be administered from this place. But, oh, God, save that lost person. Reach out right now into that heart and say to that person, you're not saved. You wouldn't go to heaven if you died. You don't know Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray that it might be the day that their hearts may be tenderized and turned toward you. Pour out the salt from heaven of the Word of God and sprinkle it upon their lives and help them to see their need of Christ and bring them to the place of repentance today. And, God, whatever the need might be, Christians who are cold and backslidden, restore those people today to real joy and fellowship. In Jesus' name I pray, and for His sake I ask it. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Somebody come up here and kind of move this wire back out of the way, Dan, so nobody has to be afraid to come to this altar. Brother... I can't think of his last name, who pastors in North Carolina was preaching down at Myrtle three years ago, and he was preaching on demonism. While he was preaching on demonism, the two big flagpoles that they have, both of them at the same time, and they're hooked to cement. And they're made out of pipe, two and a half inches big, three inches around. Both of them, while Brother Carl, what's his last name, dear? Can you think of it? Who's in Israel with us? The older gentleman who pray, preached so much? I can't think of it right now. No. Carl Lackey, Brother Carl Lackey, was preaching on demonism on that platform at Myrtle, and those two flagpoles both came in at the same time, missed him by about that far. He was so close, so it should have stayed. But I'll guarantee you one thing, the Lord's going to send it. 
And when the devil fights, that's when the Lord gets the greatest work done. And I just know something great is going to happen around here all week long because of that incident. Nothing else ever took place this morning. I know something great is going to take place. Amen. God's going to do something. He's getting ready. No devil, you can fight all you want to. And I want you to hear this too, wherever you are. You listen to us. God's going to do work here this week. And we're not going to be convinced of anything else. And we're going to see it happen. Amen. The old devil don't like good old-fashioned tent meetings. He thinks we ought to go back in the confines of a modern auditorium where we've got carpet on pews and on the floor and on the ceiling and on the walls. He, in big fancy chandeliers. He doesn't like this sort of thing. This, this humiliates some folks. Draws the makeup off their eyes. Amen. When they have to shed some tears for the glory of God. Amen. Takes away some of the pride, the bases, the heart. Humbles them before God and exalts Jesus. And that's what the devil don't like. But we're going to see it happen. We're going to see it happen. And glory to God for it. I'm glad that the, for the burden God gave me to see tent meetings start in this area and stay in this area. I'm glad for it. And others are following suit. And I praise the Lord for every tent meeting we have in this area. I hope they just swell this area with good old-fashioned Baptist tent meetings again. <laughs> Amen. Well, they can shout and praise the Lord and get happy and enjoy the things of God and come apart from the things of this world and the responsibilities and the cares of this life where we can see folks get saved and mean business with God. Reminds me of a young man who got saved. He called his wife or his mother long distance and said, Mom, Mom, guess what happened to me tonight? She said, Well, I don't know what happened to you tonight. He said, I got saved. And she said, uh, Well, we'll wait and see. That mother wasn't too far from wrong. What she was saying was, I'm going to see whether or not your life's going to add up to what you say you did. A little while later, he called his mother after he'd been serving the Lord faithfully for a while. He called his mom and said, Hey, Mom! He said, Guess what? She said, What, son? He said, I've been called to preach. She said, Well, we'll wait and see. Sometimes I don't want to take a wait-and-see attitude on everything and be skeptical about everyone, but I guarantee you one thing, we're not waiting and we're not seeing enough, they that wait upon the Lord. But if you're here today and you're lost without the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll save you today and He'll make your life different and things will be different from today on. If you're a discouraged Christian, you're defeated in your Christian life, you're backslid on God, you've gotten out of His will, today is the day the power of God's here, the Spirit of God is working, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to get it settled. Now's the time to get it all taken care of. We've stretched this old carpet out here for you to come put your knees on, get before God. And if there's some things you need to get straight as a Christian, I want you to just step out of your seat and come on. Don't go into this revival meeting with your heart not being right with God, with being out of fellowship. Don't hinder what God wants to do this week. Let's see it done. Amen? What's the page? Number 401 in your hymn book. Come every soul by sin of Preston's mercy with the Lord. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. That's the only one. I only trust Him. Only trust Him. Do it now. Now is the time to do it. And it says, Come every soul by sin of Preston. If you're lost today without Christ, we did not give you an opportunity to raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand to get saved. All you got to do is step out of that seat, come on down this aisle, take your place here at this altar, personal worker, come with the Bible, show you from the Word of God how you know you're saved. I would want you to leave here and think so, hope so, maybe so, you know it. And if you're a Christian, you're cold, that's why the altar's open. You come, come on, while we sing on this song, come on. Come every soul by sin oppressed, his mercy with the Lord. Amen, you come, come on. Yes, God help you, come to me. to rest, I trust in His Word. Oh, we trust Him. Second verse, you come. trust him. Only trust him. Before we sing on that next verse, I know that we don't have to have 
45 or 50 people to the altar to say we've had a great day. When God's working, if two or three people come this altar and get their hearts right with God and they get revival in their lives, coupled with the revival that God's already given to many of our folks, I don't think you're going to go to an old independent Baptist church that has any more revival every Sunday than does Faith Baptist Church. There are times when we can't even get out of the song service when we got 25, 30, 40 people at the altar just getting things right with God. And I'll tell you, it's a great spirit when God puts it on us that way. He doesn't do that every Sunday because God doesn't have to use that method every week. But whatever He selects and chooses to use, it'll be all right with me. But I'll guarantee you one thing. If you're holding back, you're the loser. If there's something that between you and God that you need to get settled, that you've not come to the altar and settled yet, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to get it all taken care of. Now's the time to get it settled. Today's the day. You ought to just get it all taken care of now. While we sing on this next verse, and I believe it is the last verse. Is it? No. This is the third verse. While we sing these last two verses, because we're not going to sing any more than this song. If there's a need in your heart, step out of that seat and come to this altar. I don't care how meager it seems to you. God's impressing you with it. Get it taken care of. Don't go into this week of revival with anything. Get it settled today. Come on, while we sing on this third verse, you come. Step out of the seat and come right now. Come on. It'd be all done. We don't ever close the invitation here. I mean, there's always a time when you can get things settled with God. We want you to know that. We'd never close it up so you couldn't come talk to anybody after we're done. But this is the last verse of this song. This will be the last song we're going to sing. This is the last verse. If you need to come, you come while we sing on this last verse. Come on, right now. to this week. Amen. Don't forget now, every night at 7 o'clock. And I'm sorry for those of you that have to work nights. I'm hoping that you can get a personal day off, Brother Bill, during the week sometime. Hallelujah. That's good. Amen. You can get in on it then. Don't forget now, we'll be here every night. Of course, we'll be back under the tent tonight at 7 o'clock for a regular Sunday night service. And then every night this week, Monday through the next Sunday, Next Sunday, just have dinner on the ground. Songmaster will be with us all day long. They'll come our way on Thursday of this week. But prior to that, Brother Jimmy Robbins be in tomorrow afternoon from Calpin, South Carolina. We're going to have a great time. He wrote me and said, Brother Preacher, we're going to have a tremendous revival. He said he'd never been to Michigan before. He thinks he's going to come up here and warm us up. But we're going to show him when he gets here. Amen? Amen. We're going to show him we already a bunch of hillbillies, and he doesn't have to do anything to warm us up. Amen. We're just looking forward to seeing God bless in a very mighty way. If you have been our guest today, we've been privileged to have you. 
I mean, we welcome you to the services at Faith Baptist Church. We love you. If you're saved, we love you in the Lord. We're glad you're here. If you're not saved, we long to see you get saved. We're glad to have John and Kathy McClish with us today. Good to have John back, and we're glad to have them with us. Amen. Glad to see them. Praise the Lord. And for the other couple who came here today, I believe I've seen that lady before, but I don't remember that I've seen the gentleman before. Perhaps, maybe I haven't seen you before, but you looked familiar to me when you came in. We're glad to have you. We want to welcome you here and invite you back and be with us again. I trust we've showed ourselves to you to be friendly if we have it, shame on us, and you come and report the scoundrel to me, and we'll meet with him and excommunicate him, all right? We're glad you came. Glad you were a part of our work today. Let's bow our heads in prayer and be dismissed. Brother Bob Burnett, you dismiss us in prayer, please.